Right now, we are in a very critical moment for investigative journalism. The rise of populist and autocratic governments all around the world has made it more challenging for investigative journalists in what used to be free, more open, more democratic societies. We see a lot of closure in, in the political spaces in many countries. And so journalists have to, have to work in more difficult environments where they are threatened, harassed, intimidated, where they are derided as elitist, corrupt, or purveyors of fake news. We've never seen this much, not since I started. I started doing investigative journalism in the late 1980s, when the, there was a lot of opening in many countries. Where I come from in Southeast Asia, long-standing autocratic governments were falling and collapsing. The press was opening. So I was able to do, my colleagues and I were able to do investigative journalism in these spaces that have opened up. Now we see these spaces now beginning to close again. And that's very worrisome because investigative journalism needs to be done in places where there's information access, where the rights of journalists are, are respected and protected, where we can rely on the support of, of institutions to protect and safeguard the work that journalists do. Investigative journalism is still being done, but it's, in, it's being done under far more challenging circumstances than there have been in the last 30 years or so. So do you sort of fear for the future? What I see now is a challenging moment, but it's also a moment that's ripe for opportunity because people are hungry for news. People want their governments to be accountable. Uh, in the U.S., for example, there is much more money available for investigative journalism nonprofits. In, in the U.S., for example, we see more funds being made available from foundations or philanthropies for investigative reporting because there is a realization that this is the kind of reporting that is needed at this moment. We see my students, for example, see more openings for investigative reporting jobs. Uh, around the world, I think there is much more demand for investigative reporting. The fact that we are here, where 1,200 investigative journalists from around the world is a far bigger number than there have been in past international conferences, means there is a global community. The, the good thing about this moment, which didn't exist 25 years ago or 30 years ago, is there is really a global community, a global movement of investigative journalists. And that's something to be thankful for. In the end, we can rely on each other's support to keep this work going. But then again, among many of these journalists down here, many of them are working in countries and regions where it's, it's another ball game. For sure, there is a lot of differences in conditions under which investigative journalists work. In North America and in Europe, investigative journalists can go around their work freely. They have the right to access government information, to get government data. Uh, officials give them access. They allow themselves to be interviewed. In many countries, that is not the case. Investigative journalists are imprisoned. They're killed. They're banned. Their newspapers or radio stations or websites are shut down. There are a lot of challenges, but still, there was no such thing as investigative journalism in Azerbaijan 20 years ago. There is now. Um, in the Philippines, under the Marcos era, there was no investigative journalism for the most part. There is now. It's there, it's happening, it's robust. It's challenged. Burma had, was close to the rest of the world um, just five, six, seven years ago. That is no longer the case. There is investigative journalism happening inside Burma now. In the past, investigative journalism that was being done was outside by journalists in exile or by foreign journalists who slipped inside the country. There's something to celebrate that despite all the challenges, despite the harassment, the intimidation, despite the killing and imprisonment of journalists, investigative journalism continues to thrive. I like to think of investigative journalism as like an orchid, you know, a fragile flower. It will grow even in the most difficult circumstances, because there is a community that nurtures this orchid and allows it to blossom. There are many differences in the ways investigative journalists work because the conditions are different. In some countries, you have no access or very little access to government records. So investigative journalists adjust their techniques to the conditions under which they work. In some cases, 
investigative journalism can be done only with cross-border or international collaboration because it's very dangerous for individual journalists in a repressive country to do the work by himself or herself. So cross-border collaboration is very important in places like Central Asia, for example, where there are real restraints on the ability of journalists to report freely. In some countries like the United States, where, where there is still funding, where there, it's, the press is really free despite Donald Trump, journalists are pretty much able to work on their own in their own news organizations. So we see differences in the way journalists work. We also see that there's a lot of similarities. Investigative journalists are like a tribe. You know, regardless of where they come from, they have the same characteristics. They like to dig for information. They are relentless. They are patient. They will keep asking questions. You cannot satisfy them with very shallow answers. They will get to the story no matter what. And that characteristic unites, those characteristics unite investigative journalists wherever they come from.